Hi, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to part four in our series, Interrogating Global Contemporary, Art, Research, Pedagogy, and Museums. I'm Sandra Zalman, Director of the Art History Program at the University of Houston. And this series reflects the intellectual investments of our faculty and of the graduate students in our MA program, now proudly celebrating its 10th year. It complements the work our students do in the classroom, as well as the many paid internships and instructional assistantships they hold that amplify their studies. Houston is the most diverse city in the nation. And as such, my colleagues, Natalie Haran and Dorota Bichel and I were conceiving this convening. And we felt a particular urgency to address the global contemporary here in Houston. Thinking locally about the implications of the global we are not here merely to celebrate the global contemporary paradigm, but to critically interrogate its emergence, its influence, and its implications for the future of our work as researchers, teachers, and curators. We wanted to ask, what is global contemporary art and how is it remaking approaches to artistic practice, scholarship, and curation? In a moment of cultural reckoning that has rendered past efforts at diversifying and expanding the canon insufficient, how can the idea of global contemporary art help us to critically and ethically engage in the reconstruction of a historically exclusive discipline? As academic programs and museums adopt this rhetoric, along with its weaknesses and blind spots, is global contemporary art here to stay? Back in 2019, in a pre-COVID world, uh, we conceived of these events as a one day in-person intensive convening. And we were grateful at that time to receive support from the University of Houston's Division of Research for our plans. And then subsequently to join up with the University of Houston's Blaffer Art Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston as organizational partners. However, circumstances now allow us to have a go at a truly global conversation so we invite you to enter your questions in the chat window at any time during today's program. After Professor Gupta's remarks, we'll get to as many audience questions uh, as time allows before ending our program promptly at 4 p.m. Central Time. If you'd like to ask a question verbally, please raise your hand during the Q&A and we'll call on you and you'll see a window uh, inviting you to unmute yourself. Uh, my colleague Dorota will be monitoring the chat and now I'm going to pass the virtual microphone to my colleague, Tyler Blackwell, the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Associate Curator at the Blaffer Art Museum on the University of Houston campus, who will introduce our esteemed speaker, Professor Gupta. Tyler. Thank you, Sandra. Um, it's a real pleasure to join you all today. And I'm honored that the Blaffer Art Museum is a presenting partner for this series, um, along with the MFA Houston, as you mentioned, and of course, the UH School of Art. Um, just very quickly, I'm very pleased to share that the Blaffer has recently uh, reopened and we've opened with a new exhibition of works by the artist Stephanie Siuko. And in just a few days, actually, on Halloween, uh, we'll, we will open a major exhibition of the British Japanese artist Simon Fujiwara, which is called Hope House. I hope that our digital audience today and our local Houston colleagues who are tuning in might learn a bit more about these projects online and perhaps even visit safely. <laughs> Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Atreyi Gupta. Dr. Gupta is currently assistant professor in the history of art department at the University of California, Berkeley. She's presently completing non-aligned decolonization, modernism, and the third world project, India, circa 1930 to 1960, which is a book on the artistic and intellectual resonances of the non-aligned movement during the Cold War era and the interwar anti-colonial Afro-Asian networks that preceded it. Other book projects include Post-War, A Global Art History, 1945 to 1965, with Okwe and Weiser. Her most recent curatorial project includes When All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, exploring the intersection of the folk and the modern in post-colonial India at the UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, which is co-curated with Lawrence Rinder and I believe is still on view at the museum for just a few more days, perhaps. <laughs> um, Professor Gupta, thank you for joining us and welcome. 
Thank you, Tyler, for a very generous introduction. Um, and, and many thanks to Sandra and Natalie and Dorota for moving forward um, with organizing this virtually despite it all. Um, we've, we have been in communication for, for what seems quite a while now, um, but we are gathering now in a very different kind of circumstance. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn to the work at hand. Um, I'm going to try sharing my screen. Does that, did, did that work? It looks great. Thank you. Uh, my talk today is titled uh, Two Propositions Concerning the Global Contemporary. And in a way, um, it is a reflection on um, the questions and thoughts set out uh, as the premise of this gathering. Uh, to begin then with Amy Cesare. I'm not burying myself in a narrow particularism, but neither do I want to lose myself in an emaciated universalism. There are two ways to lose oneself, wall segregation in the particular, a dilution in the universal. My conception of the universal is that of a universal enriched by all that is particular, a universal enriched by every particular, the deepening and coexistence of all particulars. These words appear in a letter Césaire wrote to the then General Secretary of the French Communist Party, shortly after the gathering of leaders from 30 newly independent countries of Asia and Africa at Bandung, Indonesia, in 1955, and the Congress of Black Writers and Intellectuals that followed soon after. As such, the letter belongs to the tumultuous history of decolonization in the post-war era, after the conclusion of the Second World War. Although decolonization has not been central in conversations on the global contemporary, it does nuance the discourses of the global contemporary with a different inflection. I believe this is because the conception of the contemporary as a discrete period in art history is inseparable from a certain conception of the post-war years as both a beginning and an end. For long, the year 1945 had prefigured in art history as a rupture, an ostensible break with art of the past and the beginning of new modes of experimentation, temporarily and conceptually wielded to the aftermath of the Second World War marked out as early as 1958 in the edited volume, New, Nash, New Kunch Nash, 1945, the first survey text on the post-war art of Europe and the United States. The idea of 1945 as a pivot in the trajectory of 20th century art was further concretized in the very next year during the second iteration of Documenta, when curator Arnold Bode chose Kunch Nash 1945 as the exhibition's title, as the exhibition's theme and subtitle. Arguably, if the curatorial emphasis in the 1959 documenta prog programmatically centralized post for abstraction, the, the 1958 book edited by the influential German modernist art historian, Will Grumman, made an analogous discursive move by conjoining an idea of newness, new, to, the, to art since 1945. Most European and North American art historians and critics of the time conceded that there was something radically new about post-war as an art historical period. And as Emilia Jones has noted, by the end of the 1970s, taking the post-war decades as significant in marking a key point in North Atlantic art history. Art history departments in Britain and North America also began to explore the possibility of teaching courses on art after 1945. 
over the subsequent decades since 1945 came to be institutionally embedded in art history as a discrete period, but one that was most fully centered on the North Atlantic worlds and to which, were, and to which other worlds were imagined as linked by a chain of belated echoes. This would change only in the late 1980s with the arrival of another discrete cultural field called contemporary art. As if after modernism's formal energies were seemingly evacuated and under pressure from neoliberal economies and globalization. As art worlds expanded exponentially with the creation of international contemporary art biennales in formerly peripheral locations, such as Havana, Guangzhou, D Dakar, they also seemingly made distant places proximate. Established geocultural frames of references mutated in the face of rapid economic, political, and cultural globalization as artists, curators, and scholars both uncovered new convergences and divergences and excavated traces of historical flows and exchanges. Where in the past, such critical tools or paradigms as neo avant-garde or postmodernism could illuminate or explain substantial aspects of Western contemporary art, now they clearly had little critical purchase in the crowded and one might add resplendent space that has become global contemporary art, wrote Chika Okiki Ogulu in response to the 2009 questionnaire on the contemporary circulated by the editors of October. Paradoxically, it is precisely at this juncture of globalization and disciplinary expansion that another art historical rift surfaced, one that marked the global out as the exemplary realm of ultimate alterity. Two distinct strands shaped this discursive delineation, squarely appending the global to economic globalization. The first demarcated contemporary art defined within this discursive matrix as art produced in the age of post-1989 globalization as the only proper domain of global art. Hans Belting, for instance, affirmed that global art had emerged like a phoenix from the ashes from modern art, and it is by definition contemporary. Global contemporary art, Belting also notes, noted, differs from modernity whose self-appointed universalism was based on a hegemonic notion of art in Belting's words. However, nuance in its attention to the uneven cartography of 20th century art, such a positioning of the global nonetheless relegated modernity to North Atlantic frontiers, delegitimizing in process modernism's multimodal habitations. The unintended effect was the unconditional reinscription of a center periphery model that presented Europe as the beginning and originary locus of modernism, the center from which modernism as an aesthetic discourse was transmitted to the rest of the world, traveling slowly, arriving late, almost inevitably marked by a temporal lag, a delay, a certain belatedness that had only been appended in the post-1989 arena of global contemporary art. Is the post-1989 economic globalization then the only cipher for com comprehending the global? Arguably not. The second discursive strand took seriously the counter models through which the displaced, those formerly placed on the margins of European modernity, entered modernism by producing experimental cultures evolving out of imperialism and colonialism. Many artistry departments in North America and Europe did precisely this by instituting new faculty positions and initiating programs with a designated emphasis on art artistic and cultural practices outside of North Atlantic traditions. For the North Atlantic strands of art history, the global turn registered as something like a punctum, signaling a crisis within the discipline itself. University curricula changed and new readers appear to have appeared to address the discipline's expansion beyond Westernist frontiers. 
in some instances, new faculty lines were also created. Art history was finally alert to the demands of the formerly marginalized, or so it would appear. But ironically, this progressive move was weighed down by a Westernist conceptual hubris that seamlessly supplanted an older and much beleaguered descriptor, the non-West with the global. In effect, this otherwise self-reflexive effort yet again ended up compacting the Euro-American Euro tradition into a self-referential contained category with global modern and global contemporary as its privileged mode of counter narration. Then what, the discerning reader, uh, discerning listener may ask, is at stake in thinking in terms of the global contemporary? A lot, I would say. If the second discursive strand that I described above reparatively marks the non-West as the proper domain of the global, while delimitate, with delimitating geocultural binaries, the first positions post-1989 economic globalization as the sole arbitrator in the production of a global contemporary, disarticulating with equal alacrity, a much longer ontology of the global already prefigured in the perspectives of the formerly marginalized. Let me elaborate using two interlinked vignettes paced across a period of 30 years, across the interwar and the postwar period, across the modern and the contemporary. This is necessary because the relationship between the modern and the global still remains unresolved, more in some parts of the world than others, and because a keen sense of temporality in turn underpins conceptualizations of the global contemporary. By way of working out these concerns, I want to make two propositions concerning the global contemporary through two vignettes. My first vignette takes up the theme of the global and the second, that of the contemporary. A confounding collage appears in an artist's book that Auburn Indra Tagore completed in 1936. A monumental figure of an African man excerpted from the glossy pages of a magazine emerges out of the narrow opening of a comparatively miniaturized Arc de Triomphe in Paris with a force that causes a sharp rip in the gateway's flimsy newsprint photograph. The heightened blackness of the face and exaggerated facial features indicate that the image repurposed by the artist had gained, it, gained its initial signification within a racial and racist image world that repeatedly visualized the non-European body as less than human. In a radical reversal, the artist highlights the rip on the printed paper with black paint and reworks it into a resplendent monarchal crown adorning the black body. Figures of Indian nationalists appear immediately below this assemblage, rendering proximate, otherwise dispersed and disparate colonized worlds. The conjunction between Africa and Asia signals an equally important demand namely the demand to be recognized as active agents of history on an international stage. Both themes, Afro-Asian solidarity and the desire to be sovereign subjects in a global arena would receive sharp emphasis by the time of the 1955 Bandung Conference. Yet Tagore's collage, part of a compendium of 207 collages that the artist compiled between 34 and 36 in the pages of an artist's book, prefigured the moment of Bandum by almost two decades. In contrast to the recalcitrant collage described above, the opening of the artist's book seems fairly bland. The frontispiece declares that the artist has adopted the Ramayana, an epic of kingship, sovereignty and war, composed between circa 2000 BCE and 2000 CE, to script a jatra, a highly melodramatic form of vernacular theater. The decision to adopt the epic is not out of the ordinary, given that the Ramayana was and continues to be revisited by numerous artists, novelists, and playwrights. <laughs> 
Just as Jatras conventionally began by summoning protective divinities, Tagore uses a section of scratched out text at the bottom of the page to produce a schematic shape of Ganesha, the elephant headed god of auspicious beginnings. But a photograph of a Nazi coin issued in the same year that Adolf Hitler took over as the president of Germany, pasted on a page in the introductory section, hints at the weight of the account that follows. The visual tempo shifts slowly. A few pages later, the word warning appears on the distended torso of an inquiet, misshapen body from whose wide open mouth gigantic eyes protrude. On a following page, the viewer encounters a preposterous collage of the Ramayana's legendary King Rama, conceived here as a bald fisherman with a protruding belly, a comic composite figure in whose hands the gigantic grenades appear doubly hazardous. The epic symbolic order all but splinters on another page when a 1936 newspaper photograph of Stalin's army in Moscow's Red Square stands in for the demon Ravana's army. While the rehaul of Japan's military equipment under Prime Minister Fumi Marukonyo shortly after the country's alliance with Nazi Germany functions as a visual corollary for the righteous King Rama's preparation for war on the opposite page. These loaded visual punctuations make the collages remarkable. How to unravel such far leading vectors, India, France, Italy, Germany, Russia, Japan, in a collage compendium conceived and executed by an artist based in a city in British India, far removed from the Second World War's primary theaters in Europe and East Asia. Even if we momentarily set aside the fact that this was the first collage compendium created by a South Asian artist. What are we to make of such a prescient interwar imagination of Afro-Asian solidarity long before the idea received definition as part and parcel of the process of decolonization in the context of the Bandung Conference of 1955 and long before the spirit of Bandung was marshaled by intellectuals such as Amy Césaire and Franz Fanon to interrogate the ongoing dynamics of colonial and imperial oppression worldwide. That we are not looking at reality, but at an imaginary is clear if we return to the monumental figure of an African man emerging out of the narrow opening of a miniaturized Arc de Triomphe. If the technique of collage had allowed for an inversion of the ideal epic monarch Rama's heroic body into that of a mishappen figure, the very same technique of representation imaginatively re-enfranchised the black body, a black body routinely parodied in contemporaneous caricatures produced in Europe and circulated across the colonized world through the medium of print, re-signified by the artist within a dissonant representational register, the black body now becomes part of a different narrative loop. The Arc de Triomphe was no less significant as the artist had excerpted the photograph of the Arc from an article published in a, the regional journal, in a regional journal, on the memorable history of the Les Marseilles, of the song Les Marseilles, occasioned by its French composer's death centenary in 1936. As S.R. Rana, the founding member of the Paris Indian Society, movingly described it for the readers of the sumptuously illustrated miscellany, Modern Review. It was sung all over the world by the oppressed people. In Russia before the war, by the young Turks in Balkan countries, by the Egyptians. In short, wherever there was a movement of rebe rebellion in the world. Indians, Rana reminded his readers, en encountered the song in Tamil, Hindi, Bengali, and Gujarati translations. The Arc de Triomphe was then both an oblique reference to the oral strains of the French national anthem hummed across the colonized worlds and the oppositional material imprint of ongoing French imperialism in Indochina, the Caribbean, 
and elsewhere. The refusal to territorialize British India's anti-colonial struggle within an ethnological register then amplified entangled pasts and heightened an image of an imaginary revolutionary future. We could say that in the interwar years, the world had already become agonizingly proximate. And the sense of the nearness of distant places was in part propelled by the technological and informatic networks of the era. Anxious for speedy links with its possessions in Africa and Asia, Britain prioritized the development of British air services in Africa, South and Southeast Asia and Australia. British telegraph cables reached an unprecedented number of miles. This made Britain the default telegraph exchange of the world in turn linking its colonies in Asia and Africa. We may infer that our artist felt this acceleration of speed and the resultant compression of space and time keenly. In his collages, he juxtaposed news photographs of British mail planes with bold typography, announcing the construction of a new airport and one of the first planes. And he overlaid an image, image of the much celebrated fifth century Indian Buddhist cave temples with the filaments of modern cables capable of sending signals across vast transcontinental topography simultaneously. The upsurge of the archaic and its contentation within contemporary news photography was especially evocative. For unintended by the imperial powers, the telegraphic information grids turn in the tropics led the colonized to envision their own nation less as a close cultural or political unit within an established world system, but more as part of a much wider and indeed interconnected web of anti-imperial groups poised to create a new world from the ashes of a shattered imperial order. To many, nothing seemed more certain than that the towers of London, Vienna and Paris were about to fall, as the then Bloomsbury-based young Indian novelist Mulkrajan and recollected in retrospect. The transformation in the scope and scale of cultural imagination, Evans and Arnon's recollection reflected in Tagore's immediate intellectual circle as the artist's interlocutors debated on Hitler, Franco, Mussolini, and Conio's actions in Germany, Spain, and Japan, and closely followed anti-imperial struggles in China, Burma, and North and South Africa as well as dialogued with major international anti-fascist figures, such as Roma Rolla, Nancy Kunhard, and others. The Indian Progressive Writers Association even sent a message to the World Peace Congress in London, condemning Mussolini's subjugation of Abyssinia or Ethiopia in 1936. The Modern Review, the journal from which to our artist had excerpted numerous news photographs for his collages, interspersed reports on the crisis in Abyssinia with photographs of the Imperial Palace at Addis Dabba in Abyssinia built by Indian architects and carpenters. The intensity discernible in the intellectual realm refracted political developments that had culminated in the Congress against colonialism and imperialism organized by one Indian communist then in political exile in Berlin. The Congress, where over 170 delegates of 134 organizations from South Asia, North Africa, South Africa, Palestine, East Asia, and Southeast Asia had gathered with a mind boggling spectrum of leftists, pacifists, socialists, communists, and civil rights activists from the United States, Soviet Russia, Britain, and continental Europe took place in Brussels in early, early February, 1927. This is how the Indian political activist, Bakar Ali Mirza described the gathering. In the stories told in a dozen different languages, in the reports of facts and conditions, we saw that imperialism is the deadliest enemy of human life. Is there any wonder then that at the palace edgment where the Congress took place, 
people with different languages and cultures, different shades of opinion, found themselves among men and women who instinctively understood and that they could work in, in harmony. That Mirza portrayed the bonds formed across languages and cultures as instinctive, a pre-political sentiment is noteworthy. For these are also the terms in which the African-American civil rights activist, Richard Wright, would describe the Bandung gathering of 1955, when newly independent nations of Asia and Africa uh, came together nearly 24 years, nearly two decades later, in precisely these terms. Richard Wright writes, this was a meeting of almost all of the human race. I felt I had to go to that meeting. I felt I could understand it. The similarity is particularly striking, especially because of the vast temporal and material disjuncture that separated Mirza's, or for that matter, our artists, interwar, interwar colonial milieu from Wright's rapidly decolonizing world. The Bandung Edict, the Bandung Verdict, as documented in the final communique of the conference, was unambiguous. The, as it stated, the Asian African Conference of 1955, having considered the dangerous situation of international tension existing and the risks confront, confronting the whole human race from the outbreak of global war in which the destructive power of all types of armaments, including nuclear and thermonuclear weapons could be deployed, invited the attention of all nations to the terrible consequence that would follow if such a war were to break out. Explicitly, the communique interjected in debates unfolding in the United Nations. Implicitly, the conversations at Bandung centered on the question of how a global conversation on humanity could genuinely acknowledge cultural diversity without distributing, distributing such diversity over a hierarchical sliding scale of alleged civilizational progress or its obverse. Both the Bandung Conference of 1955 and the non-aligned movement that it helped to initiate in 1961 was replete with internal tensions, as others have noted. Yet the political multilateralism launched at Bandung nonetheless rendered a deep fissure in the monopoly of Westernism, not just over the definition of the global, but also in the discursive delineation of the figure of the human as right was quick to discern in 1955. It was a claim to the global that served as the ground from which to resist the epistemological violence of Westernism. It was also within this discursive and political matrix of the global that an idea of an intellectual third world accrued definition as part and parcel of the processes of decolonization in the post war years. 1955 and 1936. I juxtapose reverberations across a gap of over two decades because I want to emphasize that the spirit of Bandung, a vivid imagination of the global, from the perspective of the formerly marginalized, was a disposition already punctual to the interwar years as well as to the modern. And this was a point that does not centralize the North, the North Atlantic world, at least in the realm of intuition and imagination. This much is certainly evinced by the Imperial Arch in Paris, whose constricted opening can no longer fit the monumental black body without coming apart at the seams in the South Asian artist Obanunua Tagore's interwar collage. The global then needs to be approached in relation to the means of its imagination. It is not enough to use the global as a tool of analysis in relation to political economy. This is my first proposition. My second proposition pertains to the contemporary. On 23rd August, 19, 1962, 
a group of 12 young artists gathered in the, in a, in the quiet suburban town in Western India at the exaltation of artist Jagdish Swaminathan to plot an artistic revol revolution over the, over the course of two sleepless days and nights of conversation and debate. The group 1890, an artist collective was born. 1890, the numerical moniker with which the collective christened itself did not refer to a year in any calendar, Gregorian or otherwise. Neither did it function as a code enunciating an abstruse aesthetic proposition, nor did it signal any specific ideological position. Instead, the moniker simply acknowledged a coming together of people in place. 1890 was the number of the house where the group had gathered to draft their manifesto. One year later, in 1963, the collective heralded its presence with an exhibition the resonance of which the Mexican poet, Octavio Paz, then Mexico's ambassador to India, described as being akin to being surrounded by infinity in his catalog essay. The invocation of the word infinity was not purely rhetorical for the word calibrated for Paz and the group 1890, a sense of contemporaneity that was grounded in place but simultaneously insinuated a reckoning with the global that hurled the contemporary into an entirely different cosmology. The group 1890 conceived the 1963 exhibition as a site to manifest a whole new world of experience and to open up the threshold for the passage into, a, into the state of freedom as their manifesto described it. At face value in a post colony, the word freedom had a strikingly familiar ring. Arguably, the question of aesthetics and the question of freedom had been caught in a tight dialogic bind in South Asia from the 19th century onwards, as the Manifesto II acknowledged. Independence in 1947 had further tightened the bind between artistic projects and national projects, caught as artists were in questions of identity, authenticity, and the dreary temporality of a belated modernity. The 1890 manifesto in contrast sought an orientation away from such logocentricisms. And I quote, art for, art for us is not born out of a preoccupation with the human condition. We do not sing of man, nor are we his messiahs. The function of art is not to interpret or annotate, comprehend or guide. These may have seemed heroic in an age where man hungered for vindication. This to us is but the perpetuation of the death wish of the state of unfreedom of man, unquote. Against the assurance of the still developing country's certain progress towards a techno-rational future of proverbial plentitude, the group 1890 offered a rather different conception of movement, a movement without a determined destination. As Paz put it on behalf of the group, to say that we don't know where we are going with certainty is the proof of our lucidity. Absurd in gesture and defiant of reason, the declaration had a surreal ring. The works, as art critic Shamlal recounted, spun their own magic. At the far right of the exhibition hall were Jairam Patel's sculpturesque wood paintings, whose surfaces the artist had gorged out with a blowtorch, leaving blackened scars reminiscent of the deep traces of geological time. In his drawings, these marks of time etched onto wood often assumed fantastic shapes that seemingly invoked the recesses of the earth's body. As one commentator wrote several years later, Patel's drawings brought memories of fetal darkness, of history in the womb. In this ritual, curious flora and fauna participated. A similar elemental consciousness was discernible in Himbert Shah's paper collages, 
where the surface became an analogy for parchment to skin and the burnt lines, the accretions of wound. Having accidentally burnt a piece of paper with a cigarette, Shah had become mesmerized by the fragility of paper and the precocity of its surface at a time when the, flat, when the fact of flatness had gathered discursive density within the field of international modernism. Think Clement Greenberg. Despite the dissonant formal preoccupations, an agile conception of materiality animated the collective. Consistently, the group 1890 artists reaffirmed that they were creators and that the work of art had no communicative intention. Instead, the act of making was an event, a happening, opening up a passage into the communicative potential internal to material itself. Therefore, Patel exposed the surface of wood with a blowtorch to release the field of primal energy embedded within it. As for Jag Jagdish Swaminathan, he spoke of painting in precisely these terms, in terms of an encounter, an unique experience, a miraculous revelation, a thing of wonder, just as when a child first opens its eyes to its surroundings. The work did not proceed from an idea he maintained. Instead, replete with vitality, the image entered the world as the artist gave himself over to its magicality. Once born, the work entered the space of the viewer, pulsating with the same occult energy. Or so Swaminathan believed. It is difficult to believe in magic today. As one art critic rightly observed in his reflections on the 18, 1963 exhibition. But for Paz, the experience was, being, was analogous to being surrounded by infinity. Infinity for Paz lay beyond the outward reaches of Western modernity. It splintered the time of history to a zone beyond the reaches of Western modernity's self-assured progress towards a techno technorational and indeed predetermined future. The true intellectual cadaver of a time is not Marxism, but the idea of history as a depository of a mythical transcendence, Paz insisted. Recognizing the idea of modernity as irrevocably aligned with the post-enlightenment conception of history as unique and linear process of succession, Paz saw the end of this history in the immeasurability of infinity. These ideas were no, doubt, were no doubt shaped by his readings of the Mexican revolution, his perception of the anteriority of colonial rape endlessly reproduced rather than transcended in the march of historical time and his understanding of indigenism as an intimate haunting of an interiority that could if excavated, serve as the wellspring of an indigenous modernity. To be sure, this idea had within it an embedded sense of what we now recognize as contemporaneity, an anachronism, disjointed relationship to time, in Agamben's words. An aspect, and this is an aspect that has been explored by others in relation to the notion of contemporaneity with which any engagement with a global contemporary must grapple. But for Paz, as for his Indian friend and artist interlocutor, Swaminathan, this contemporaneity had a very precise beginning. Contemporaneity, as Swaminathan Paz would have it, belonged to the former peripheries, India, Mexico, and the global south, as early as 1950, Paz had argued that the logic of modernity, a tradition of rupture, had come to a grinding halt with the post-war fracturing of the center and the simultaneous rise of the third world, whose revolts and national rebellions he recognized as the insurrections of particularisms oppressed by another particularism that wears the mask of universal, mask of universality, namely Western capitalism. If the collapse of the center rendered all, all places peripheral, 
then the aesthetics of this universal peripheral peripherality, the poetics of the now in Paz's terms, was poised at the end of the telos of, of history with a capital H. Such a possibility of an indigenous contemporaneity resonated with Swaminathan, at whose prompting the group 1890 had gathered and who had polemically declared, I stand where the first man stood. This leads me to my second proposition. I propose we re-enter the contemporary through a critical politics of place, through the formerly marginalized or exiled, standing alongside Swaminathan. I also propose we reintroduce the politics of place into conceptualizations of the global of the global contemporary. For then an entangled landscape of the global contemporary becomes discernible, one in which multiple specialities, temporalities, and power relations combine, not just to illuminate different vectors of the global and the contemporary, but also the global and the modern. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atrey. You can keep yourself unmuted so that we can continue the conversation. Um, that was such a powerful and rich set of works and ideas, and I'm really excited to unpack some of them for you, or with you, excuse me. Um, um, but before we launch into this kind of back and forth, I wanted to remind folks that you are welcome to um, introduce questions in the chat at any time and we will get to your questions. And we also invite you to ask your questions verbally. So in your participant window, um, there should be an option for you to click to raise your hand. And when we get to the, um, the audience portion, um, I will call on you to, to voice your question. Um, so thank you again so much, Atri. Um, I hear you introducing a number of important interventions and reminders as we approach approach this question of global contemporary art. On the one hand, um, your research and your arguments are pushing against this idea of a kind of nomadic cosmopolitanism that has been celebrated um, for decades through the paradigm of global exhibitions, biennials, and the uh, you know, sort of most famous examples of the global contemporary artists that we have. And you're giving us a very deep historical consciousness of alternative ways that we might be able to come to this notion of the global contemporary, reminding us of these moments in history um, in the 20s and 30s and in the 50s when powerful thinkers are already forming a kind of um, counter politics to a Westernist approach to this paradigm. One of the um, particularly um, useful interventions you make is to um, kind of give us um, a, a walkthrough of the historiography of global contemporary art in the presentation that you gave and also in your prior writings and um, acknowledging the ways in which um, attempts to write the global contemporary as um, originating in 45, or 60 or 89, um, as much as we sort of like to get tied up in knots about um, uh, sort of rethinking our positions from those temporal standpoints, we have to acknowledge that even those three dates are extremely Westernist in their orientation. Um, so I, I want to start by asking you to expand further on your, about your recentering of the 20th century and into the 21st around the event of the Bandung gathering in 1955. Um, and if you would be willing to um, tell us a little bit more about how that, you know, what, what your um, sort of, uh, what the, the effect of your, of your intended intervention is there to recenter history around that event and how that plays out in the larger book project um, that this research is a part of. Um, thank you for a very rich question um, and a very complex one. Arguably, one could, one could say that 
um, I'm recentering uh, a conception of the 20th century around yet another dateline. Uh, and that, and arguably that dateline is no more or le no less effective than 45, 1960 or 1989. Um, the moment of Bandung, uh, the, way I, the way I'm trying to approach it in, in my larger thinking about uh, the modern and the contemporary, but as well as in the book project, um, functions less as a dateline, but more as a um, intellectual co point of coherence. Um, as, as I hope to have shown through this talk, um, and, and as, I, as I show in, in other writing elsewhere, um, 1955 was the gathering of 1955, when um, 30 colon, formerly colonized countries came together at Bandung, Indonesia, to speak of another universalism, to speak, to speak really in terms of the global. Um, had a longer history. Um, and it was possible to come together in 1955 in part because of the uh, end of the Second World War and uh, the unfolding processes of decolonization. We may, we may pull back the boundary date line. Um, we, we may pull it back to the inter interwar years uh, precisely because there's already a certain kind of thinking about uh, what the global may mean and what it means to be global from the margins. Um, that that's political leaders, activists, thinkers are already uh, engaging. Um, and in that regard, uh, the 1928 gathering in Brussels, uh, where many of, the, many of uh, those who gathered in Mandung had already come together. Um, serves as an interesting entry point into Bandung um, to, or rather, as I would like to, as, as I would like to put it, thinking in terms of Bandung. Um, precisely because uh, this is also an event that generates its own um, cluster of cultural imaginaries. We encountered one uh, in the collage project that I shared today, uh, but those of you who are familiar with Du Bois's Dark Princess, would recall um, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the opening sections of, the, of, of, the, of Du Bois's novel, a gathering um, of the dark, of what Du Bois describes as the darker, darker world, um, gathered around a dining table in, in, in Berlin. If we go down the list of the, of the figures gathered there, um, it's interesting to map it with Bandung. It's, it's almost as if Du Bois was already predicting uh, something that would take place 20 years later. Um, but I realize I'm, I'm completely messing around with chronology and historical timelines here. But what I'm trying to suggest is that I'm less, I'm less wedded to the idea of 1955 as a dateline. Uh, but I'm more interested in what Bandung means um, as a conceptual category, um, because we already know that the Bandung conference, as well as the non-aligned movement that it helped spawn, um, was replete with internal political tensions. Um, and some have rightly argued that, that the imagination that emerge, uh, the, the non-alignment as such, uh, did not in fact, achieve, had made limited political gains. Yet the gains that it made intellectually, uh, conceptually uh, was tremendous. And it shaped what, uh, one, could, what one could describe as a, as, as, a, as a third world intellectual consciousness. Um, and so in that sense, the moment of Bandung becomes um, provocative, interesting, generative uh, in thinking about uh, both the idea of the global as well as the modern and the contemporary.
Is there, in that sense, a way in which we might be able to um, speculatively read a kind of bonding symbolism or aesthetics into some of the works that you focus on? Um, the collage you illuminated by Abhidranath Tagore was incredible, a hugely provocative image and what a find in a set of what looked to be um, sort of personal journals or collage books. Um, but I think also of your work on um, F.N. Souza's Black paintings, which also engage a sort of um, aesthetics of, of um, a sort of like a, of personal projection and um, self alignment across um, nations or across sort of um, cultural belonging, and also aesthetically um, uh, participate in this sort of um, um, these qualities of 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 masking and occluding and and revealing and and um, and exposing um, visual imagery. I am, in fact, deeply interested in thinking about um, thinking about bandung formally, uh, and actually thinking about what kind of um, creative practices. Uh, formal engagements uh, with both material and imagery. And that this, that what I'd like to describe as the Bandung consciousness, consciousness uh, generates. Um, in, in, in the case of Abhinindranath Tagore's collages, um, that question becomes really extremely pressing uh, in part because the, because the project is monumental. It, this is a compendium of 200 collages. Um, and this was also uh, the first collage project to be undertaken by any South Asian artist. Um, so, and the project itself raises several questions regarding artistic form as such. Um, why collage? Why in 1930s? Urban, the artist himself was known as uh, was best known for his watercolor paintings. Um, in, a, in a particular visual idiom that we may synoptically uh, describe as revivalist. He was, he was returning to pre-colonial painting traditions. So how does this collage Im imagery come together? Um, and the fact that there are 200 collages suggests that this was a significant uh, artistic investment undertaken over a period of several years. Um, in case of the collages, one, one, one could in fact argue that, uh, and as I have indeed done elsewhere, uh, I've, argued, I've, I've argued elsewhere that uh, the medium of collage was somehow more felt uh, more appropriate for the artist. Uh, as he was seeking to imagine a future that didn't quite exist, yet its traces were already present in the, it was already present uh, in, his, in his everyday, uh, in the discussions that he was engaged in, uh, but also in the kind of uh, caricatures, uh, in, the, in, the, in the kind of imagery that was circulating within his um, immediate cultural, cultural circuits. Um, so um, I am deeply interested in thinking about um, the bonding consciousness uh, in, in lines with, with a formal engagement um, to ask if there is indeed um, anything like um, a third world modernism. Um, and and if, if there is, what does that look like? I'm interested in pursuing this question in part because I do believe that words accrue meaning uh, when we when we speak in terms of abstraction, uh, when we speak in ter terms of surrealism, um, and you could sup supplant that with any any terminology. Those words already uh, have bear the weight of a particular history. Um, so. Thinking in terms of the global, be it the global modern, be it the global contemporary, then necessarily involves a kind of a detournement, uh, whereby 
the the pre-existing ideas, notions, histories that certain that all of our terminologies have accrued um, can be realigned, reoriented to speak of a different world, uh, a different point of entry into the contemporary and the modern. Indeed. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask a kind of self-reflexive question. Um, one of the reasons why we were very excited to bring you into this conversation is because um, I think sort of generationally, um, you occupy a kind of first wave of, of a professoriate who have who carry the title global contemporary art historian or global modern art historian. Um, but based on all of the uh, of um, your previous scholarship that I've read, um, going back all the way to 2007, there's actually two pieces that you wrote or co-wrote in 20, 2007 and 2017 that kind of bookend thoughts about the you know the sort of global reach of art history or its ambitions to be global. Um, um, but I just love your sort of critical op occupation of this title of global contemporary art historian. And I was just wondering if you could reflect more um, on that, like how does one critically occupy this position in terms of your research, in terms of your teaching, in what ways can, can this term be useful to us even as we remain sort of deeply skeptical of it or ambivalent about its use? Um, it's a complicated question. Okay. Um, I, do, I, I have been, and I continue, I, I was, I have been and continue to be deeply, deeply interested in thinking of thinking about the global. Um, the 2007 essay that, that you mentioned was, was one that was written, uh, when I was when I was an MA student, um, and I'm sometimes sometimes rather surprised to find that, that that I have actually continued to think through the thoughts that the ideas, thoughts, and concerns that uh, that 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 really early essay um, brought to the table. Um, I'm interested in thinking about the global in in part because I'm, discon I'm disconcerted by, um, by the ways in which the global too becomes uh, another story of Euro-America. Um, yet there was a certain imagination of the global um, that far predates globalization. Um, but also that the question of universalisms and particular particularities that shape this idea of the global. We now think of the global contemporary as, as multiplicity. Uh, but this was an argument that was being made by, by anti-imperial thinkers from the early 20th century onwards, repeatedly over and over again. Um, and so my own, own own interest is to, to be alert to those voices and to enter the global from the periphery. I take very seriously um, the notion of thinking in place, or rather the thinking of global in place, uh, precisely because when we begin to think in terms of place, some kind of nuances that, um, that come to be lost um, in a in a in a in a in a in the so-called placeness placelessness of the global uh, produces yet again another story that's largely North Atlantic, uh, a story in which uh, all others seemingly play the role of uh, rendering and I'm, I'm putting this really bluntly, but rendering the North Atlantic more global, um, never, we, we don't, we conventionally, we don't, when we invoke the word global, we are necessarily thinking of the non-West. Um, it's, it's almost as if the non-West needs to now come back um, and make the not, not, make North Atlantic artistry more 
rich or richer. I don't know. I don't know how else to put it. Um, and that th this is precisely why um, I'm interested in thinking in, in, in thinking in uh, line, thinking in terms of the global. Um, but I also believe that the global cannot be adequately theorized or thought without being, without looking at the world from a certain place. Because the, the shape of the globe shifts depending on where we stand. Absolutely. Yeah, and I love this phrase, universal peripherality that you introduced. It seems like we could all stand to infuse our work and thinking with a little bit of that. That's kind of a dose of sort of humility in relation to our knowledge and our epistemes. Um, thank you so much. I would love to open up the conversation to those of you who are here with us on Zoom. Uh, please drop your questions in the chat. And I do recognize some friendly colleagues in the audience. So please also feel um, empowered to raise your hand in the participants uh, panel. And I will happily call on you to voice your questions or comments. Dorota, I also welcome you to jump in if you have any questions you'd like to pose. Yes, hi. Uh, since I am not seeing any questions in my chat box, I would like to ask you uh, a question, Atri, if I may. Uh, I really appreciate the inf intervention in thinking about the global as, as I'm tying it to the North Atlantic paradigm. I wonder, I, th I think the question that I have is whether the category of the global can also be useful when we think about writing of art history as it is so strongly tied to the history of nation states. So how can category of the global be useful to pressure on the struggles that had been articulated not only between the anti-imperial post-colonial nations and the former imperial forces, but also within those nation states and nations of themselves as well. That, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. And, and, I, and I suppose we, we must, uh, if you're thinking historically and from place also incline the global um, to, to internationalism, which was the term current um, in, 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 the, in the 1950s and the 60s. Um, and, and indeed a little in the, from the 1920s, 30s onwards. Um, in as, as much as internationalism inclines the construction of, the, of national histories and national art histories uh, towards what lies outside it, uh, the global serves to, in my mind, serves to perform um, a very similar function. Now, I've often shied away from um, using internationalism as a nomenclature in part uh, because internationalism is also tied with a certain history of the communist international. Um, but many of the intellectuals from the peripheries, artists and intellectuals um, from, from a, not, just, not just South Asia, which serves as, as my conceptual home, uh, but, but across uh, Asian Africa and uh, the present day Middle East, were not necessarily aligned with the communist international. In fact, uh, from the, fr and, and we see this over and again, uh, from the 1930s onwards um, and way into the 1960s, third world intellectuals constantly broke with the communist party. Uh, Fanon categorically uh, writes that Commun Marxism has to be altered to speak to the peripheries. Um, Jagdi Swaminathan, um, whose, whose interactions with Octavia Paz I briefly explored, um, was what, I, what he, he described as a, 
he described himself as a la lapsed communist. Um, so was Octavio Paz. Um, and so in a certain sense, internationalism, because of the history of the red the term, doesn't quite capture adequately um, the processes of alignment um, that the global can. Um, and, and more certainly, uh, the global takes us far beyond uh, nation-centered nation histories. Uh, and that's part of my interest in the global. Thank you. We do have a question from Rebecca M. Brown. Hi, Rebecca. I'm going to ask you to unmute and ask your question. Hi, everybody. Hello, um, friends new and old from all over the world. Hi, Atreyi. Um, I wanted to, this has been so stimulating and so interesting, and it's always great to hear new pieces of your project. Um, and I, you know that I am also very interested in this term freedom that you um, brought up again in this talk. And I wonder if you might use it, if, if I might get you to tell us more about perhaps how we might think of a, a detournement of freedom in the context of you know the 1960s in India and um, the the exhibition coming from the US of abstract art and sort of trying to spread United States versions of freedom and the ways in which the artists um, in group 1890 and at the time more broadly are trying to um, rethink their own relationship to that term both as artists, as expressive artists, but also as, you know, participants in a society that ostensibly, you know, won its freedom. Um, so, in a, in, but is is at that point in the '60s, kind of wondering what that means. Um, and I was particularly, I was particularly interested in this relation to infinity that you drew out. You know, that from from Paz's reflection on the in the catalog or in the pamphlet for that show um, in terms of, you know, it, infinity can be read as a kind of openness, a kind of freedom, but it also can be read as a kind of yet another universal, a kind of modernist universal that gets put in the center again. So, so I absolutely, the way you're framing it makes complete sense in terms of it getting us away from the teleological temporality. But, you know, I wonder how is, are we all, you know, is, he's also detourning infinity to a certain extent, right? So I'm just, I wanted to get you to say more about those terms that are bubbling in the 1960s and, you know, what, how this relates to your conceptions that you've been talking about, about a localized global being read from that particular moment and, and, and location. That's a Thank huge you. thing, so. <laughs> Thank you, it's so good seeing you. Um, so, so let me start here. Um, from, the, from, from the early 20th century onwards, uh, there is a certain kind of critical um, thinking about freedom in relation to sovereignty um, emerging from South Asia. Uh, but other colonized contexts as well. Um, and um, and in, in a certain way, this idea of artistic freedom, freedom of imagination, um, freedom in a, in, a, in a political context where there is limited, um, there is limited uh, political possibility, if you will. Um, and these ideas, as far as I, as, uh, as far as I understand them, um, comes to inflect the thinking about form itself and the writing about form. Um, and again, this is not, this is this is not specific to South Asia, um, but a similar process can be traced in other former colonies as well. Um, it, it is almost as if the work of work of art, the practice of art, is 
politics by other means. It is a means, uh, not just of actualizing that what, actualizing what does not in fact exist, uh, but of imagining, imagining and thus bringing to bear upon reality a certain imagination of um, a time when one is already free. Um, Within the processes of decolonization, this, this, this wonderfully flexible um, construction of freedom uh, or sovereignty um, be comes to be linked with the history of nation, the nation state. Um, so you, one, one maps it, maps the anti-colonial period leading to the post-colonial to the coming of the nation state uh, and so on. And again, this is, this is true of um, most former colonies, right? Um, it seems to me that during the Cold War, um, precisely through the staging of abstract expressionism as freedom um, and, and, and Soviet realism or communism as unfreedom, um, this, this idea of freedom begins to get a critical edge. Um, it plays out in 1960s through Octavio Paz and Swaminathan, uh, through infinity, as, as you very rightly point out, um, as a kind of a outside to uh, the march of progress. Um, and with the understanding that history and progress has a definite end in mind, um, and infinity takes us outside all of those loops. Um, no doubt this is a mod modernist invention, uh, uh, but it is, but, but I do want to, do want to um, emphasize that this modernist construction uh, nonetheless takes very seriously, uh, seriously a, 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 a a perhaps a naive idea of uh, deep time, uh, geological time, one that something that can be pulled up uh, in a in a way that can restart or perhaps short circuit um, the teleology of progress and development. Um, yeah, that I think addresses your question at least in part. Do you want to respond at all, Rebecca? I can, let me see. Here we go. All right, there we are. Um, yeah, thank you. That was that was great, Atre. And it, it connects to me. There's also this, that, that, that deep time you're referring to resonates for me with, um, what you mentioned briefly also in that same context, um, the idea of magic, right? And the idea of a kind of um, uh, counter to um, a certain kind of enlightenment or reason um, found in this kind of, these other resources that are not teleological, that are not, um, that, that are not valued by a kind of a Northern Atlantic framework, but that are, very similar um, modes of understanding knowledge. They're just sort of devalued, peripheral, local. And so this idea of bringing that ineffable, transcendent, you know, mystical, what, however you want to, again, localize it um, into the conversation and, and taking it seriously, I think is something that Swaminathan Paz and a lot of the artists that else, you know, certainly the artist I'm working on, um, KCS Ponaker is, is sort of thinking through um, so that's another, for me at least, that's another resource. It's the magic and ast astrological kind of mm -hmm. approaches to knowledge. So, thank you for your for your answer. It's very helpful. Yes, thank you. And indeed, when this work, uh, your writing, is published, I think another additional value of it is that it it um, re-relativizes um, the North Atlantic as well, and it reminds us that terms such as freedom have very different valences and different contexts. And 
we can, you know, expand our purview and um, populate it further and, um, and um, help sort of shrink the dominant parts of the canon and um, really expand and, and fill it in with these other voices. And, and in particular, I, I love this dialogue that you illuminate um, between Paz um, and the figures you focus on because it totally, um, it, it again thrusts um, the North Atlantic into the periphery in a very um, illuminating way. It reminds me of, you know, if I was teaching this material, I might teach it alongside the Zero group, for example, or, um, you know, the Italian Futurists or Arte Povera mm -hmm. and different notions of obliteration and infinity in this post-war period, yeah. Dorota, I was wondering if I could loop you back in and ask if any of this is resonating with your work in the context of Latin America. Yes, I do think so very much so. And I actually also have a lot of questions that I think that might maybe bring some problems to the fore. I am just immensely curious about how Paz gets looped in, so to speak, with 1890 group to begin with, especially given institutionalization of the Mexican Revolution and sort of his excessively compromised uh, role vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, progressive uh, intellectuals and artists in Latin America during that time. Um, so Boz has a fairly extended relationship with India. He, um, he spends substantial amounts of time um, and he, but perhaps insofar as uh, modern and contemporary art is concerned, his time in the 1960s is, is most generative because that's when he comes into contact with um, not just the group 1890, the artists of the group 1890, but becomes really very intrigued to um, New Delhi's cultural sphere. Um, it, it, this this occurs at a time when the newly decolonized nation state has und undertaken um, a process of rapid development, um, and many artists, including those of the Group Eighteen Ninety, have a very conflicted relationship with this with with, with, with these rhetoric discourses of progress. Um, and in that in, in in that moment, so the in that moment, Paz not only um, becomes one of the one uh, interlocutor, uh, but remains associated with the group eighteen ninety in 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 very substantial ways. Um, he even writes a poem on Jagdi Swaminathan, um, and of course, he writes extensively. Uh, on his on his South Asian experiences, uh, he leaves India in 1968. Um, he resigns from his position after the Mexican in, in the uh, during the time of the Olympic. Um, it's highly unlikely that the South Asian artists would have been fully aware of Paz's conflicting relationship back in Mexico, um, but rather they would have been more attuned um, to his arguments about indigeneity, uh, precisely because these are, this is, this, they are themselves thinking in those lines at, at this specific historical juncture um, as an antidote to either abstraction or realism, a debate that's unfolding in, 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 in the Cold War sphere. Um, so it's so we could even say that there is um, India's Octavio Paz, um, and 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 this this interlude fits um, within Paz's larger over um, somewhat uncomfortably. 
Well, thanks. Thank you so much. It took me a while to find my unpeeled button. So, surprise, surprise. Uh, so I wonder, I'm really interested in these uncomfortable tensions between projects, especially as they as they articulate themselves between the artist and intellectuals and the projects that you know either align or don't align with nation state. Uh, I think I'm very curious to know to what extent these internal tensions play a role in your project. In my larger project or, in, or, or rather in the book, these internal tensions have to be centralized and I do so assiduously precisely because it, um, it allows us to resist creating another hegemonic narrative about the global. Um, what I'm least interested in is the seamlessness of the global. Um, and part of the interest of the larger project is to uh, precisely problematize it. I do, and, and, and this is exactly what I mean by uh, the global must be seen from place uh, because what, what its contours are shifts uh, once our own position within the field shifts. Absolutely, thank you so much. I hope we have an opportunity to expand on that conversation sometime because I personally feel like we've merely scrapped a top of the proverbial iceberg. Indeed, thank you so much for your engagement with us, Atri, and we very much look forward to the book. Thank Keep you. Talk about it. Thank you everyone for joining us. And I would just like to remind you that our final event is slated for November 9th. We're having a global roundtable. We're bringing back Atreyu Gupta alongside David Joslett, Mari Carmen Ramirez, and Leah Dickerman for an action-packed conversation uh, uniting a lot of these different discourses that we've developed over the last several weeks. So we hope very much to see you then. And don't forget to vote. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Thank you.